Am I, my mic is on? Okay, good. Okay, it's great to uh, my, uh, introduce today's seminar speaker, Dr. Juan Pascal. Juan is the inaugural holder of the Once Upon a Time Foundation Professorship in Pediatric Neurological Diseases at UT Southwestern, and he's also the holder of the Ed and Sue Rose Distinguished Professorship in Neurology. Juan is a native of Spain. He received his MB from University of Granada. He then came to the US and received the PhD in molecular physiology and biophysics from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. He then went to New York City and did his postdoctoral training at Columbia University and then I believe did his residency at the Washington University in St. Louis. After that, he then joined the UT Southwestern in 2006 as an assistant professor in neurology with secondary appointments in several other departments, including, most importantly, the physiology department. As a physician scientist, uh, Juan directs an active research laboratory where he studies the molecular mechanisms underlying inherited metabolic and excitatory disorders. And he uses a variety of approaches, including electrophysiology and MRI and, and the molecular approaches. He um, also directs the, a rare brain disorder clinic at UT Southwestern, which is focused exclusively on the diagnosis and treatment of rare neurological diseases. And I, I just read about this introduction of the, um, about the rare, a rare brain disorder clinic at UT Southwestern. It actually treats about 400 patients each year and you know, which come from all over the world. And this is a, a huge accomplishment. And what I, um, I would also like to tell you that Juan is a very prolific writer. And you know, like all of us, you know, he writes about primary research papers and he publishes um, over 60 of those primary research papers. But his what's very unique about Juan is that he also authored over two dozen or so textbooks. And perhaps among them, the most well-known is the Rosenberg's molecular and the genetic basis of neurological and psychiatric disease, which is now in its sixth edition with about you know, 2,000 pages. And this is a textbook, of course, he co-edited it together with Dr. Rosenberg, and who is also in this audience. OK, so I'll, now I'd like to turn the podium over to Juan. He's going to tell us about experimental augmentation of brain function. Welcome, Juan. Hey, well. Thank you very much, uh, VJ, and um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Paul, for hosting me, and thank you, all of you. I went quickly through the list of attendees, and uh, most of you are friends, so you're all biased <laughs> in my favor. Uh, but I should say, if anybody has any questions, you know, just feel free to ask uh, as we go, and I'll try to deal with it. Uh, second, I apologize. I've given two other talks today in a patient-oriented uh, symposium, so my voice is sort of <laughs> a little bit poor. So if you don't hear me, just raise your hand or say so, and, and I'll try to uh, <clears throat> do better. So thank you. So the, the topic for the day is really how to increase uh, brain function, and you know, very broadly defined. It's a very um, lofty goal, and I'll try to show you whether we have succeeded or not. It's customary to talk about conflicts of interest. I don't think I have very many. Um, these are primarily uh, academic activities. And I want to say thank you in addition to all of you for having me, to my laboratory members, most of which are online now connected, to our institution for being great, uh, NINDS for being nice enough to continue to fund us with no interruption, and then finally, uh, patients and families. It's only presenting some of the patient level data <clears throat> to all of you. So over time, we've moved in a slightly different direction when we talk about um, research in the laboratory. One has been to move into um, the behavioral level. Um, in addition to the molecular phenomena, the cellular phenomena, the circuit phenomena, we've tried to emphasize to move up to behavior as the ultimate goal of outcome, you know, whether a treatment, whether a phenomena. If it doesn't impact behavior, we don't believe that it's going to be too helpful to uh, 
patient or to a subject or biologically that, that useful. And second, when we do a clinical study, we also try to look into, um, we also try to focus on what's really helpful to the person, not so much the indicator or the biomarker or some other phenomena, what's really important to a, to a human being when we do clinical study. And there's a couple of things through the talk. One is that <clears throat> we do a lot of uh, uh, redundancy uh, augmentation. By, by comprehending a disease mechanism, we ask the question, how can we bypass it using a, another natural process that may be uh, quiescent or dormant or not very active, just so we can reach the same goal uh, behavior-wise? So taking advantage of redundant pathways or mechanisms. And second, <clears throat> the second uh, approach is highly reductionist, is that at the end of the day, whatever happens to a brain cell, it should have uh, repercussion on the cell membrane. That's how cells communicate, that's how cells do things. If it doesn't have an impact on the cell membrane, whatever may happen to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to, to, to that process may be, it probably doesn't have the same um, 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 significance. And here's an example of uh, redundancy. That's a baby who was in Germany and he does have a mutation in the myostatin gene, which as well now, it's a mutation that limits uh, muscle growth. Uh, he, he's mutating myostatin, so therefore he has bigger muscle. He can do many things that a baby can never do. And um, here is an example of applying that concept to a, a very uh, different situation. He's an infant with a motor neuron disease from spinal muscle atrophy. Um, the site of pathology is on the right-hand side. It's a motor neuron in the spinal cord, and yet, it's possible to uh, inhibit myostatin so that by increasing muscle mass, a great deal of the defect is palliated or compensated. So that's an example of, without knowing very much about the primary uh, pathophysiology of the motor neuron loss or death, um, it's possible to go ahead and augment the other end of the circuit, in this case, increasing muscle mass to be able to treat these mice. Same is represented in here. Anybody who likes New York has done this. So whenever you get an obstacle to get to one location, you can take a detour and reach the same place. It might take you longer, but eventually you can probably get there. And the same applies to metabolism, which is a major topic for today. Uh, there is usually more than one way to get to a metabolic um, end uh, product. Um, it's usually more than one metabolic pathway to achieve the same result. The question is whether that alternative pathway will be equivalent to the original pathway or not. And second, as I said, we're really um, very reductionist in that we try to look at um, cell membrane properties primarily. Um, just because it's a great deal of things that happen in neurons that don't mean anything much at all. These are um, human cells on the left that have accumulated a variety of uh, byproducts, uh, autophagy, lipids, neuromelanin, lipofusion. If you look at the right chart, all of these things are related to age. They grow up, they go up as you increase in age. Uh, none, of we have any, none of which have any functional consequences. These are healthy, elderly people who have uh, abundant inclusions along these lines. and um, The cells are okay. So again, um, we think that um, at the end of the day, the membrane has to be affected in some way. Otherwise, cells have no way of communicating what's happening to them at a short of time. And so I'll be covering um, an example of augmenting uh, metabolism in, a, in the uh, rodent. I'll be uh, talking about the metabolism and excitation relationship, which is what we've been working on for a long time. I'll be talking about how we do that in people, how do we fuel the brain um, through alternative metabolic pathways when we have an obstacle due to a disease. And uh, next, how do we do that through mass action? That's a very different concept. I'll go into that in a second. And then I'll be talking about how to augment uh, motor performance in mice, and that involves finding genes that confer super performance and also looking into um, resistance to injury. And finally, I'm going to be uh, presenting uh, the new work uh, just recently when we've gone into the pay, uh, just to try to comprehend um, some of the features that I just mentioned in a high level um, complexity and brain. I have to acknowledge the people in the laboratory foremost. Uh, these are people who are long gone. 
or in theory they're gone because I keep coming back <laughs> to the lab. So I'm not sure why they never left. Uh, and then we have very bright uh, people on the um, clinical side, and Lauren is actually now on the laboratory side as well. Uh, these are individuals who have you know, amazing talent to take care of patients and do clinical trials and ask clinical questions. And then people who are present in the laboratory. Um, again, very many thanks to, to all of them for a um, great um, environment um, to work in. And so what do I mean by uh, the, the equilibrium or balance when the tablet is in ex an excitation? Well, that's how much the brain uh, is able to put out. It's not very much, um, but it's very um, balanced along the lines of two activities. We think of metabolism as taking wood out of a forest, chopping it up, getting it ready to either burn it on the left or build something on the right. That's what metabolism does, the two components. They go together, they're equally important. And um, I'll be discussing um, the relevance of um, catabolism and anabolism for, for a particular brain disease. And that's even made them more important because as a pediatric neurologist, you know, we're very sensitive to the fact that a great deal of that metabolic activity is actually higher in the developing brain than in the adult brain. On the upper left, this is the uh, rate of glucose consumption by a um, child brain. Uh, the horizontal line is adult level. So by age five or six or so, there's a much greater um, glucose consumption rate than in the adult, and it will come down uh, to adult level in the second decade or so. Um, now, why do I say that excitation and metabolism are coupled? This is how excitation was identified at the uh, cellular level um, in the squid axon. If you follow the um, uh, rectangle in green uh, across the next few slides, you will see um, what can be done with the um, giant axon. So it's this structure cut across. Um, here is the axon in, in the walls are yellow um, and then here's a pipette. As everybody knows, this is a nerve impulse, uh, canonical uh, image in physiology. And at that point, right at that moment, it was also recognized that that also happens because of a metabolic activity that has to maintain the ionic gradient. So here in blue, we call this ion exchange or ion flux excitation. We call the sodium potassium also an electrical phenomenon, but it's also a metabolic phenomenon, which is the provision of ATP just so the gradient can be maintained. There cannot be one thing without the other. They're linked, they're coupled, they're quantitatively precisely related. And the question is, you know, how exactly, um, what, what is that qualitative relationship? Why are they coupled? How do they work? Why do they have to, how does one relate to the other? And the way they relate to one another is that they're intimately uh, um, linked. As I said, one will support the other. And there is no other way. And in fact, in disease states, when there is a decrease in metabolic flux, for example, the right-hand side PET scan of a patient with epilepsy, you know, um, bright um, orange or white representing glucose signal, radioactive glucose signal that went into the brain, it's low here, this is a temporal low, um, it's diminished uh, redness as opposed to the opposite side, and that's because there's less glucose going in. Uh, that's a typical PET scan in epilepsy. It's a hyper-excitable region, and yet there's a very low amount of glucose heading into the brain. So again, low metabolism defined as, in this case, as entry of glucose with hyper-excitation. It is the case in pretty much every brain metabolic disease that I know of. Um, normally, there is a decrease in metabolic flux because of an enzyme or a transporter. And normally, it's also an increase in excitation, which to me is highly paradoxical. Well, why does hypometabolism doesn't just lead to hypoexcitation? Um, you know, the, the gradient may dissipate. You know, eventually, you might have a, a very silent uh, cell. It's actually quite the opposite. It's a hyperactive neurons. Why so? Well, we look at the um, brain glucose transporter, GLUT1, which is represented in here. And this is the, um, the fundamental framework for brain metabolism. Here is a blood vessel cut across in orange. And here is a red blood cell in red. It's in the vessel. And glucose in a blue arrow getting out of the uh, uh, blood uh, and the blood cell getting into a uh, clear and then eventually will make it into a neurons in green. Now neurons have GLUT3, they don't have GLUT1. 
red blood cells and the blood vessel wall and glia, all of them have GLUT1, but not the neuron. And what happens when GLUT1 is mutated, meaning uh, usually uh, hyperinsufficient, is that this pattern happens. So on the left in um, orange, uh, that's a PET scan of a subject with uh, GLUT1 deficiency. And um, it's a fairly low amount of orange, and there's a lot of blue, which means also low um, intensity of glucose in the brain. That image ought to be uh, red. Uh, if it happened to be normal. There should be a lot more going into the brain because of that mutation in the transporter. It's less. And then the person has this type of peculiar epilepsy where they have these episodes of this um, um, seizure phenomenon. It's a little spike and a wave, spike and a wave, spike and a wave, about three times per second. And that can go on and on and on until it terminates. Um, this is what happens um, with that phenomenon. Uh, this is an example of a subject in the uh, AIRC in one of the um, scanners who is having here on purple uh, seizure, another one, another one, another one, another one. So it's a very frequent uh, seizures, and this is what they look like by EEG. And this is a correlation with um, uh, blood oxygen level dependent signal from the brain. So there are regions that become higher in oxygen flowing through them, um, but not every part of the brain. And because of this, um, Localization, we looked at um, these particular regions in the rodent. And to look at the rodent, in this case, these are, um, uh, I believe it's a normal uh, mouse. We went ahead and developed a way to catheterize the uh, veins and also um, do EEG from the uh, epidural space. Why do we catheterize the vein? Why do we need access to the vein circulation? Because we are going to probe metabolism by um, NMR. And that's predicated on the fact that, of course, um, all of the important neurochemicals, glutamate and glutamine and GABA, are direct products of the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic cycle, acid cycle or the citric acid cycle. So glucose will come in, it will be metabolized into pyruvate, acid coi, here is a cycle, and eventually you have a very short length to glutamate and glutamine and GABA, all of which, of course, is highly active in synapses and um, any of which could potentially be accounting for this excitation phenotype we see when there is diminished uh, glucocentry. So the approach we had taken was to um, um, decrease either, um, uh, you know, these are often um, embryonic lethal um, situations when they're fully abolished, but we knock down either GLUT3, which again is the um, main uh, blood to brain glucose transporter, I'm sorry, GLUT1, GLUT3, which is in neural uh, version, or in fact, pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is a key uh, enzyme of the Krebs cycle. And then ask the question what happens downstream to these uh, products in, in, the, in the brain? And to ask that question, uh, we have been using uh, C13. Um, NMR spectroscopy. So just a reminder for those of you who may not be very familiar, again, the glucose molecule will be labeled in uh, any number of carbons. Glucose will have six carbons. So here I'm showing labeling in carbon one and six. That's uh, C13. So by definition, we ought to be able to see that by spectroscopy using the brain sample that's collected. And as you go through the uh, Krebs cycle, um, that glucose, of course, will become acetyl-CoA, um, citrate, alpha-ketoglutarate, succinate, it doesn't matter. At the end, there will be a production of glutamate that will be labeled in one of the carbons. If you know what the biochemistry book says, if you label position one and six of glucose, that label will appear in carbon four of glutamate, which will, be, will give rise to this spectrum. As the cycle keeps moving, another um, iteration, another one, another one, the spectral pattern happens to be different. You start labeling carbon two and carbon three, and that determines a different spectral pattern. So if you look uh, throughout this progression, as you have flux of the glucose molecule into the brain, it's possible to reconstruct how um, quickly this process has happened and how is the uh, conversion of glucose into glutamate or into anything else happen, because you know how the individual carbons came about in the uh, spectra. This is what the data look like. So we are infusing uh, C13 labeled glucose in this mouse. Um, here is an infusion for 20 minutes, 30, 50, 75, 150. 
And that's the evolution of the labeling in GABA carbon two, or glutamate carbon four, carbon three, glutamate carbon three, and so on. And if we do that, um, to some degree, we are able to reconstruct the flux rates um, that account for uh, many of these reactions. Uh, these are far from perfect. This is always a you know, daunting project to be able to model um, um, these rate constants, of course, as everybody knows who, who's on dynamic modeling. It depends on a lot of the assumptions and there are many weaknesses, but to some degree, we can estimate how uh, some of the, these rates went about in the normal brain and the, in the diseased brain, because again, we're reading off um, labeling in downstream molecules that are neurotransmitters derived from uh, glucose um, labeling. <clears throat> Am I going too fast so far? Everything okay? Okay. Now, those, these mice um, also have epilepsy, uh, as you could imagine, and here is a recording of. Uh, um, may I interrupt you? I think uh, Matt Saber has a question. Oh, hi, Juan. Um, I did have a question. I'm curious. Um, in, the, in, this exp in this experiment you're describing, you're tracing the contribution of glucose, but um, how much does the, the glial neuron lactate shuttle contribute to this? Uh, probably very much. We, we have um, uh, pyruvid exchange at one level. We have lactate exchange at one level, all of which are um, semi-independently estimated, but none of, all of them depend on many assumptions. So yes, mm -hmm. these are, as you know well, there's a great deal of exchange. Mm -hmm. And for our purposes, we consider that exchange, in this one disease, we consider that unchanged. It's an assumption we're making. Well, I was just kind of curious because, you know, in, in, in respond to like nutrient stress and things like that, you can kind of see that balance. It's, or it's at least been reported that you see this balance between glucose utilization and lactate utilization um, shift. And I was, you know, I was wondering if that's relevant to the types of diseases you're looking at or if that's sort of controlled for the fact that they're not under nutritional stress. It, it really is, Matt. Um, in, in another model I'll show you in a second, we quantify the uh, rate of um, alternative substrate utilization relative to glucose and we find so if you knock down uh, one of the enzymes probably dehydrogenase which as you know is crucial um, you do have a, a, a four to one uh, switch in alternative metabolic substrate utilization in the brain very cool a wild type uh, maybe i believe i have one of those um, uh, spectra to show you in a moment yeah. okay very cool thank you sure um, so now th that Metabolic phenomena, of course, has to be accompanied by an electrical phenomena because I show you the mice have seizures, and here is on the left one such mouse having seizures. But then, if you look at the uh, patient image that I show you with this cortical um, increase in bold signal, and also I didn't show you, it's an increase in the thal thalamic um, bold signal when they're having the seizure. We ask the question whether the two of them may be coupled because they're functionally. Uh, connected through, through uh, white matter connections. And this is what it is here in the rodent. So the cortex is here on the left. The internal capsule, which of course connects the cortex and the thalamus, is here on the bottom. Um, this is a 45 angle degrees brain slide. So you preserve the um, thalamic connectivity to some of the cortex in the somatosensory cortex. So you have to preserve a rudiment of the circuit. And in normal mice, um, this is a multi electrode array, of course, and there are many recording points. Only those in the square are shown here in that grid. And normal mice have, you know, this pretty silent electrical activity. If you come to the mutant mouse, it's this oscillatory wave, about three hertz, that sweeps um, all of the uh, cortex. If we sever the uh, internal capsule on the left with a knife, or if we increase um, bath glucose to a very high level, and that discharge goes away. Um, so it's a glucose dependent oscillatory phenomena, possibly related to a thalamocortical um, excessive synchronization. They're all synchronized, but not to that degree where you have these uh, robust uh, synchronous discharge. Um, here is, for example, what the seizures may look like in, in the rodent. They, uh, just to show that the model we are using is actually quite robust. It's about a seizure of 10 minutes, so it, it proved to be very helpful. Um, let me summarize very quickly. Yeah, go ahead. Can I, uh, this is Don. Um, I feel like I need some uh, 
background information yet to think about uh, why knockout of GLUT1, you know, has these effects. I'm just, uh, I suspect it's, uh, it's really well known, right? <coughs> which glutes are in the blood brain barrier, which are in the glia, you said mostly GLUT1, I guess, and mostly in the neuron, mostly GLUT3, is that right? That's right. And so, uh, what one would like to know instantly is, of course, when you knock out GLUT1, is the glucose level in the cerebral fluid changing? And, uh, right, so just, and, right, so what's in the brain barrier and are the glucose levels in the brain changing? Those are two questions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the answer to all of that is yes. The, the, um, we know from um, spinal fluid measurements that it's low. This is also the case in the patients, by the way. Lactate is also low, as you would predict. And we do know um, through uh, Roden uh, PET scans, you know, which is you know, the ultimate way of quantitating how much went into the brain, global brain, composite, not cellular resolution. So we know it's actually quite diminished. We know it's low CSF glucose and low CSF lactate, uh, both in the rodent and in the, uh, in the uh, patients. However, in the rodent, you have a slight degree of uh, GLUT3 upregulation in response to the GLUT1 knockdown. And, and that happens to be regional. It doesn't happen in every brain region. It only happens in the striatum. And I will show you some of that in a moment. So the answer is yes, but perhaps no, you do have some compensatory increase in GLUT3 predominantly, uh, but it's region selective, it's not universal. Does that answer the uh, question? Yeah, thanks. And, but then still just out of curiosity, are there any uh, characteristic differences between GLUT1 and GLUT3 function beside localization? Well, they have a different um, KM, and, and you know, Vmax would depend on how much you put into a cell, uh, but they're not interchangeable uh, kinetically. There's a slight difference. GLU3 has a bit of a higher affinity, maybe my uh, A4, I believe, in KM, if you assume that it's a Michaelis menting kind of reductionist uh, description of the kinetics. Uh, that's about it. Um, GLUT3 deficiency in the rodent, we made it, it's um, inconsequential. There's nothing to see, nothing much to see. Perhaps you have a slight frequency, it's increasing frequency in spikes in an EEG, but nothing really. Uh, some other people made a big deal out of GLUT3 deficiency because the rodent doesn't really make um, the same number of um, nests or something like that. We thought that wasn't really that, that informative, but we never found anything much in GLUT3 deficiency. GLUT1 deficiency though, we have this whole array of um, findings. Thanks, great. Um, and so we descended upon the um, cortex and the thalamus just driven by that patient fMRI image and, and the, also the properties of the discharge, the spike wave. And we normally think that when we see a spike wave uh, seizure, we normally think of thalamocortical um, activation based on other mutations of other molecules that uh, impair the thalamocortical um, synchronization. And here we believe, we, we find nothing much going on in excitatory cells, but we do find a significant decrease in synaptic uh, transmission events mediated by GABA. Nothing to do with the amplitude shown in, in the right, they're normal when they happen, but the frequency is very diminished, uh, shown here on the left, uh, in the red uh, bar here, and the recordings are here on the, on the left uh, panel. So normal is blue, um, the mutant is here in um, red, and the uh, mutant with high glucose is in green, which then normalizes the uh, phenomena. You need to use low glucose to see that. If you use the um, typical 20 millimole or 25 that everybody is using when they do brain size recording, you don't see the phenotype because at that point, presumably you're increasing the amount of substrate going through uh, residual group one. And to show that we use acetate, which would bypass to some degree uh, the um, production of acetic clay, take it off glucose and um, allow it to come from acetic acid. And that actually uh, also normalized the uh, frequency of the event. So we think this is a reversible synaptic release phenomenon. We think it's a, um, doesn't matter too much what metabolic substrate you put in. 
we don't think this is a fixed or rigid or structural uh, dysfunction. We think it's actually a fuel dependent, which gave us an idea how to go ahead and treat it. And so what we did was to um, do that in uh, patients, and we use this molecule that's uh, triglyceride. It's nothing but seven heptanoic acid molecules combined with uh, glycerol. And in the body, they're broken down into heptanoid, and that's then broken down into five carbon ketone bodies. Now, nature doesn't utilize that much um, uh, odd carbon number fatty acids. Um, as you know, there are six carbon, eight carbon, 10, 12, all the way up to a very high number. There are multiples of two. There are um, even carbon number uh, molecules. This is a synthetic molecule that has only seven. And what we thought it may do is that it fuels both sides of the, uh, of the uh, relationship here. So if you utilized, for that matter, octanoid, eight carbons, or 10 or 12, doesn't matter, all of them are cleaved in eventually into acetyl coy producing units. Uh, that's fundamental biochemistry. Heptanoic acid will be cleaved into a two carbon unit, a two carbon unit, so acetyl coy, acetyl coy, and eventually succinyl coy we felt. And that should fuel the Krebs cycle in a slightly different way. So if you have, um, for example, a ketogenic diet, which is something that these patients are put on because they have epilepsy, you're fueling uh, catabolic reactions primarily. There's no real way for that carbon that's lost from the Krebs cycle physiologically to be replenished. For that, you need a net carbon donor reaction. And that's what we felt heptanoid may be able to do in addition to supplying acetyl coenzyme A. And so why try a diet therapy as opposed to a drug therapy? Well, as you all know, most of the drugs we have in use are inhibitors. There are very few activators compared to how many inhibitors we have. Of course, they have collateral side effects, they inhibit other things. And so therefore, you normally need to be able to know how the side effect came about, how is the inhibition working. Metabolic treatment, for one thing, they tend to simulate something that's already naturally there. It's a pathway that's there, maybe at a low flux velocity, you go ahead and activate it naturally with a product, and ideally that should be more tolerable than a drug inhibition. And then um, if you augment the alternative pathway successfully, maybe you don't need to know so much about the pathophysiology downstream if you're able to replace you know, uh, the, the, the source of the problem. So this is what the um, heptanoid metabolism looks like in the uh, rodent and um, you know, this is what we predicted and these are the findings just to make it very brief it, it does indeed fuel the brain in, in a way that other substrates would not do because you have net carbon um, yielding uh, manifested as an increase in the amount of glutamine labeling uh, very quickly uh, through the Krebs cycle so we went ahead and gave it to uh, people who have this disease group one deficiency and on the left, it's one such a person having a three seizures on their EEG. And then we uh, go ahead and apply the um, treatment here in pink. Uh, we consume us an oil. This is how many seizures the person had. This is this, each of these spikes, this one seizure that we counted. And then they take the thing and this is what happens after they consume the uh, product. <clears throat> so we look at in that study, uh, I think 14 subjects. Um, this is what happens to the uh, seizures that are, they're having. Uh, the panel on the right is the same one on the left. It's just amplifying this part here because it's very compressed. Uh, so they, there's a significant reduction in their seizures. And then if we look at um, cognitive outcome, um, uh, six months later, um, treating for six months, um, we saw, for some of them, we saw uh, some gains. Now, in neurology, we're very adept to measuring the um, EEG or some other marker or the imaging. Um, you know, th at that point, there was no single clinical trial in neurology that looked at um, cognition in any significant way other than for dementia. And um, so we went ahead and tried to design a bigger trial where uh, we apply this product, which is consumed with a diet to a number of people. We're not done yet. We're finishing up in the, in the next few months, but they come in um, for a couple of days. We've been treatment, and then we treat for six months here in blue, 
and then we don't treat for three more months. And we anticipate that whatever thing we may be measuring, whether cognition or EEG or anything that you may think of as an outcome, may follow a trajectory, if successful, that will be like this. Something improving, if you keep going for six more months, some more improvement. If you stop it for three months here at the end, maybe you'll see a decline. And that's a complicated clinical trial design for those of you who do clinical trials. Uh, normally, we're used to evaluating a treatment pre and post treatment. So you measure a baseline, you do a treatment, you look at the outcome and say, okay, it, it improved, it went down, it went up. And that's your efficacy. This is a little more rigorous because here you're asking for a trajectory, not so much an arrow up or down after you do something, but actually a whole evolution of things that if you're really making this impact, uh, there should be this sort of uh, curve uh, trajectory. And so um, that's even more relevant because uh, some of that trajectory ought to depart from normal variation. So if you tell me about EEG normalization or EEG uh, benefit, well, as we know, uh, EEG depends on the time of the day, on the actual day, or many other things. But if that normalization happens to be well above normal variation, then we know we have probably made an impact in that person. And so this is uh, preliminary data. It may change, but this is the um, what happens to gamma oscillations in the EEG. Um, it's widely felt that they arise from interneuron firing, from the same neuron that I showed you a moment ago that causes this GABAergic, very, very rapid inhibitory activity in the cortex and in the thalamus. And at an EEG level, um, we call these gamma oscillations in the EEG. And it seems to be that we do have a significant effect uh, treating uh, for one day and treating for six months. And then you do some of that in, in um, uh, three more months on, on our treatment. We we'll look at um, um, synchronization of, uh, across brain regions. That's what we call coherence. Uh, it also seems to, to increase in a tiny fraction of the subjects, some of which also have a cognitive um, gain and some of these people, in some of them, um, it's possible to correlate uh, neurophysiological um, changes with um, behavioral changes. So we believe we can discern biologically uh, two kinds of uh, subjects, those in which we can modulate their neurophysiology you know, to this very crude degree with EEG and um, their behavior uh, in a significant manner that correlates linearly. And then there's some other people who don't respond the way these other people do. We took advantage of the methodology, by the way, very briefly to interrogate um, uh, tumor metabolism. That's been done by Lisa Mayo, Bob Baku, and many others, where the same type of analysis um, has been applied to uh, brain tumors to be able to, um, to characterize the, the large degree of um, oxidative metabolism that, that's present in tumor. That was a bit of a surprise. And then finally, uh, non-invasively, to be able to look at uh, two more metabolites that maybe um, correlate with uh, severity because some of the metabolites are linked to specific uh, Krebs cycle mutations that the uh, tumors contain. And more recently, we moved it up to the human brain where <clears throat> somebody who's in the audience right now and volunteered with other people to have this C13 label uh, glucose infused, and then you're observing the appearance of the um, uh, multiplets in the isotopomers by NMR in his brain uh, in vivo as he's sitting down in the lying down in the seven Tesla magnet and that's his production of uh, glutamate carbon five aspartate carbon four on and on including bicarbonate which is actually the first metabolite that appears in the human brain from glucose not, not all of these other neurochemicals but actually bicarbonate it's the first thing to go up in the normal human brain when you apply, when you miss your glucose. That was a surprise, and we're hoping to do this for patients in the near future. Um, <clears throat> um, we moved on to um, pyruvate dehydrogenase. I'll be fairly quick. Um, so again, that's downstream GLUT1 in the, uh, in the uh, glycolytic chain. This is a crucial mitochondrial enzyme. It's a gateway to the Krebs cycle. It, it allows the formation of acetyl CoA, much of the acetyl CoA normally. And this is the disease model. Patients are usually, um, they're not born 
they are usually aborted. So this uh, survival plot uh, doesn't really mean too much because uh, most of them don't, are not even born. But the ones who are born um, have about a 50-50 chance of being um, alive um, after a few years. And the rodent that we made was actually quite difficult to make because there are, it's also a very little um, enzyme to knock down. But this model, which is driven by uh, um, brain selective um, um, and GFAD promoter happens to give you about um, two weeks or three weeks of time that you can work with and do the same type of analysis. First thing that's found, um, ironically, is that these mice have no uh, function in blood brain barrier. Why, we don't know yet. Um, this is Jan who went ahead and creatively injected mice with uh, uh, dye. Upper left, it's a normal mouse. Bottom left, it's a blue mouse with the dye injected. Um, that's a brain here. Brain doesn't see much of any blue. The mutant mice, you cannot see that very well here, but the mutant mouse is actually quite blue. Uh, the, the dye permeates into the, uh, into the brain seamlessly. And in that case also, there seems to be a deficiency in the uh, in interneuron firing. Same cortical interneuron, it's GABAergic, they, they fire very quickly. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a fastest um, firing neuron in the, in the organism. Presumably, they consume a lot of energy compared to other neurons. And here is the uh, finding in the uh, mutant mouse in that particular cell type. And we believe that's due to a network phenomena called uh, feed forward inhibition failure. Glutamate on the left will come in, um, activating fires from the thalamus, they get, in, they get into the cortex. They activate pyramidal cells. Here is a triangle. They also activate this one neuron, by spiking interneuron, GABAergic. And um, when that's active, the pyramidal cell gets inhibited, therefore terminating the, uh, the excitation phenomena. If that's hypoactive, um, there is this um, uh, feed forward inhibition failure with, we believe, perhaps epilepsy. That's behaviorally relevant too, because if you and simulate the uh, whiskers in the uh, in the rodent. This is stimulated in vivo, um, and then looking at um, somatosensory cortex um, action potential um, uh, dispersion over time. Uh, this is a much greater dispersion that happens when the signal comes from the uh, whisker simulations. It's an in vivo behavioral sort of assay where uh, this is wide uh, dispersion in the reception of the somatosensory signal. Um, coming from the uh, wizard pan. And uh, Vikram went ahead and took it up, moved it up to patients with the disease. We have a few of them. It's a very complicated slide. Uh, I apologize. But in the uh, red box, you see these plots going downhill, going down, down, down. That's a loss of gamma EEG oscillations in the patient EEGs. I showed you a moment ago with uh, gamma EEG frequency that's depressed in some of these subjects and um, uh, it's getting low in these subjects. But this is happening four minutes before they have a seizure. And eventually the seizure will come on. So he was able to predict, I believe, 96% um, uh, reliability that a patient was gonna have a seizure because they started losing gamma uh, activity in the EG about four minutes before then. Uh, he actually moved it up to even uh, further out. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the Decreasing inhibitory activity happens at some point. We don't know why it happens at a given time. That leads to a vicious cycle of presumably less feed forward inhibition. Um, and then a few minutes later, you have the seizure phenomenon. Uh, that's significant. To go back to your question, Matt, I don't think it's, this is clear enough. This is to show the, um, in blue the um, EEG oscillations that are here on top, very uh, blunted on the bottom. This is a uh, response to acetate, the same alternative fuel. And um, indeed, like I said, you have about four times more um, acetate utilization defined as appearance into uh, glutamate and, and GABA glutamine than from uh, glucose in the rodent as if it had adapted to the decreased metabolic flux to compensate by using the alternative uh, pathway. And acetate resort the um, neurophysiological finding and also was able to enrich the appropriate um, molecules um, by NMR. Now, I talked about uh, 
mass action treatment of the uh, brain. I'll go back to the uh, brain glucose transport effect, GLUT1. Again, this is what happens. And I, I showed you a moment ago this uh, uh, blood vessel dysfunction from low, uh, decreased GLUT1, presumably this red blood cell dysfunction because you also have low GLUT1, clinical dysfunction, dysfunction because that's low GLUT1. Um, um, uh, we asked the question, what would happen if we just replaced red blood cells in the patients with uh, normal red blood cells. Why do that? So the blood vessel and the uh, glia are off limits. We don't do much about it. It's just the red cells we're interested in. And the rationale is that if you think about uh, glucose permeating through um, the membrane, through a membrane, say you have GLUT1 deficiency, so you have an obstacle to glucose flux, and you have another membrane, like I showed you a moment ago, there are multiple membranes in series, at the end of the uh, flux, maybe you have a low number of glucose getting in. If you happen to eliminate just one membrane, you should be able to have an increased amount of flux through the um, uh, system. Say, for example, one of the membranes actually becomes more permanent to glucose. In this example here, you ought to be able to increase the amount of glucose going in. We call the first membrane the red cell. We call the second one the blood vessel. So again, we haven't done anything much to the blood vessel or to the brain itself. Uh, that's all GLUT1 deficient as is a red cell. But here, we're asking what happens if we actually normalize GLUT1 in the red cell? What happens if we infuse normal volunteer red cells and we take out the, their patient and red blood cells? What would happen to their activity? And that was Richard Wang's idea. He's downstairs from us. He said, what will happen if you replace red blood cells? Would that be helpful? And Richard is a dermatologist, so he doesn't know much about brain metabolism. And I know enough to get it wrong. So we said, okay, let's just do it and see what happens. You know, it shouldn't work. Uh, the brain metabolic rate, it's said to be, since the 40s, not dependent on the blood glucose to some degree. It's supposed to be fairly independent. Um, Richard asked a question, maybe, maybe it is, maybe you ought to increase the red blood cell glucose. And so all of these colleagues went ahead and put together um, a human study. Now it's more relevant because in brain, a great deal of the plasma is actually squeezed out of the, um, out of the uh, circulation. So um, in some of the capillaries, this red cell here in dark gray, and it's making near direct contact with the endothelial, with the vessel wall. There's not too much plasma intervening in some of the capillaries. On the left, there's a pancreas where here's the red cell and here's the uh, plasma. So there you may have some more plasma to brain or plasma to organ flux. In the brain, it seems to be like in many capillaries at least, you have this uh, red blood cell to vessel wall uh, transfer as opposed to red cell to the plasma, then to the vessel wall. Uh, it's another example of different micrograph um, showing that sort of phenomenon. So again, um, one membrane, one barrier um, in the pancreas, and perhaps two in the brain, it, glucose has to get out of the red cell before it goes into the uh, endothelium. Now, this is type of blood exchange is done in babies. It's been done for many, many years, in fact, um, where um, babies who have high bilirubin are subject to um, exchange transfusion. So blood is taken out and then volunteer blood is put in. So we've done um, three patients so far. Um, they get their blood removed and um, simultaneously they have a donor, a normal blood um, replay, uh, put in. And this is the amount of um, GLUT1 that's um, put into the red blood cell. So these are different quantities of uh, red cell membrane, one, two, four, eight to the fifth. Uh, before the uh, exchange of uh, red blood cells and after exchange, this is how much this subject had. Pretty much near what the donor blood, the control blood had. Um, some of the quantitative data on the right hand side, that's the uh, GLUT1. Uh, membrane GLUT1 in the red cell pre-treatment, post-treatment, and here is the control. So we pretty much normalize the amount of GLUT1 that they have in the uh, membrane of the red cell. After a couple of months, as you would imagine, the red cell gets turned over, and some of that GLUT1 in the membrane goes away uh, as you're making new uh, red blood cells. And so just to make it short, these are a lot of the primary data. 
we had a significant increase in the number of cognitive variables, which is highly unusual. Um, this, again, very busy slide, only three subjects, uh, vocabulary, error rates, uh, reaction times, they go down because that's indicative of improvement as opposed to some of these, but we have been quite pleased with the immediate and the midterm effect uh, of doing this uh, sort of a treatment. I should say that it's very difficult to change things like IQ in a person um, in a clinical trial in neurology. We had about a 20 point increase in IQ overnight in, in the first subject and that, you know, that's very um, difficult to achieve then in other words. Now, need to be very brief. Um, I'll talk about the motor system next. Um, as DJ said, this is how many patients I got to see, I guess, in 2018 across the lifespan. Some of them are very young, some of them are older. And um, how many of them do you think they have a genetic disease? Can anybody speculate? How many of them have unclear genetic variants? Some of them have no genetic cause for their problem. Anybody want to guess? So most of them have nothing in their DNA, even though we look very carefully at a lot of them. And it occurred to me that what's really disabling to patients is not so much genetic diseases, it's actually plain common, not usually considered genetic diseases. This is a global disease impact. Uh, majority is from stroke, some of it is from dementia, some of it is induced by us, medication treatments, some of that is infection. We normally don't think of this as genetic diseases at all. Uh, and so that's where the problem really is, public health-wise. The paradigm we follow is a little bit different. Normally we think of a gene doing something and then linked to health. We think of a gene loss perturbing something leading to a disease. What if you have a gene loss and that leads to a gain in something and then you can enhance a biological capacity? And so Bruce was kind enough to allow us to use the um, um, demise that they were making. They were mutating randomly uh, genes in the rodent and producing quite a few of them. And then we went ahead and put a number of them through uh, motor performance assays in, you know, in a variety of techniques. And then more recently, we've taken a machine learning approach that Vikram developed to look into um, very precise properties of the uh, paw as it's moving on the uh, motor task to see what parameters will indicate to us whether someone is learning or is not be doing uh, motor-wise in one way or the other. Um, the summary is that out of, um, we used to do 700 mice a week. Uh, these are about 31,000 of them. And they cluster into different kinds of learning and behavior, as you can imagine, because of you know, a number of random mutations they have introduced. And if you look at what genes have to do with different learning trajectories, uh, not surprisingly, many of them have to do with kinases and uh, transporters and channels and other things that may be relevant to uh, membrane activity in, in these mice. And so we came across a variety of them that when mutated lead to higher performance than normal. So again, the mice will have been mutated randomly, whatever the gene may be, we, they, they all hold like some sequence so we know what gene happened to be mutated. And then we look at performance and some of them, handful of genes, um, make the mouse super performing, represented in here. In this one case, this RIF, or RIF1, gene that makes the mice superior from a motor point of view. And ben Chen was nice enough to look at the activity of this uh, mutation. This is a well-known DNA repair uh, gene. And yes, these um, cells are actually um, differentially sensitive to ionizing radiation. They don't repair DNA the way they normally should. They're also sensitive to um, uh, G4 DNA regulatory structure poisons because that gene is also involved in G4 formation, therefore um, controlling a great deal of other genes in chromatin. And then we look at the different genes that uh, become dysregulated because of that brief one mutation. And again, many of them happen to be membrane uh, property uh, genes. The hypothesis is that uh, this um, brief one gene is actually dealing with uh, NAB2, which is a well-known G4 DNA repressor, and it's also an EGR2 um, uh, repressor that's linked to, um, in fact, learning. And um, this is what the mice look like. Uh, very complicated slide to make it brief. They do have a different rate of Purkinje cell fire regularity. So in this rebellion, there are Purkinje cells. As you know, they fire very, very frequently. They are very rapid spikes. And in, in response to a movement, 
they fire a volley of action potentials. And that has a dispersion. In these mice, when they fire, when they do a movement, when the mouse does a movement, the firing happens to be way more narrow, more compact, as the movement becomes more, more precise. So maybe that's why we have an increase in motor performance. Question is, are they resilient to injury? Since they have higher motor performance, um, are, they more, um, are they more resilient to motor injury? Could the gene be used as a drug world target and be somehow modulated so that that higher performance that we have may help somebody with an injury? And what we did was to injure just one paw of the four, that one. And you do that through finding the uh, somatomotor cortex in the mouse, which is a big area <clears throat> compared to a human being. And they use a photothrombotic stroke where the rodent is going to receive a, <clears throat> a red bengal. And then the laser will zoom into that region of the brain, activate it, and then the whole thing becomes coagulated. And on the right hand, hand side, it's a, a, such a stroke in white as a consequence of that. And these are a number of them. We've done this uh, quite a few times already, and this is the injury um, here in the uh, rodent brain. Seems to be a similar size and in the controlled mice. Yeah, this is the uh, um, left uh, somatomotor area that's been injured by the photothrombotic uh, stroke. And then um, when you train them, uh, in blue will be the, uh, um, um, the uh, mutant mouse that we work with, and in blue will be the control. They're slightly uh, higher than performance and the control, and then they seem to recover better than the uh, normal mice when you cause the injury. The injury happening right here. Um, this is pre-stroke time, post-stroke time. They do seem to be slightly more resilient. They recover faster than the normal mouse may do, and that's an example of uh, some of the other parameters that we look at into in these uh, mice. So finally, let me uh, cover very quickly uh, the new model. Um, this is all very much work in progress. We, we haven't done uh, much other than preparing the groundwork. And the, the reason is that everything that I told you so far has to do with individual genes or molecules or processes or phenomena or substrates. Uh, but as we all know, it's one thing to look at individual constituents and it's a very different thing to look at the um, um, conglomerate, uh, the group of all of them. Things happen that are not necessarily predicted by the individual in any way. So if you want to comprehend how the brain works, I do believe that it's not gonna be enough with comprehending each molecule and each gene and whatnot. I think you really have to look at other phenomena that arise from the complexity of all of them connected. And so what we did was to move it up to the pig and try to use a pig brain as a more relevant um, system than the rodent brain because it has a white part, it has white matter, it has gyration, it has the appropriate uh, glia to neuron ratio, which the rodent doesn't have when you talk about the human brain. And so a great deal of colleagues, you know, up to 25 now from different departments have been greatly helpful to get the, uh, the preparation going. And, there are many students involved, and there are people in the carpenter shop <laughs> building devices and so forth. This is what the uh, preparation may look like. Um, so the uh, animal goes there, it's, it's a paradise cage. And in the right hand side, you see the um, cortical recording points with a circle. And then, if you look carefully, this is depth road measuring um, um, neural activity deep within the uh, brain itself. We put a couple of those. And, we develop a method to actually sample the brain and be able to do NMR. So on the right-hand side, there's a little sample taken from the brain. It is a biopsy needle, it's a human biopsy needle. Uh, it's about 50 milligrams of brain. And then we immediately freeze the uh, sample. This is like all neurochemistry where everything has to be done quick so you don't lose um, metabolic uh, substrates from the sample and then run it by NMR. And um, this is what the thing looks like. Open the head expose the brain, go ahead and record this, what this death um, activity may look like. And what we find already is that there is um, differential effect of anesthesia on different brain regions and on different components of the EEG. There was sort of a surprise of um, uh, any drug that we may be able to use in the future. We have to ask the question, what a differential effect on the different components of the neurophysiology, not just one or two or suppression and activation, actually it tends to be 
very uh, differential. In this case, coherence across two regions was up uh, for high frequency uh, uh, waves to go down for some of the other things. And then um, in terms of um, NMR, I think we got there and the, um, here you see the amount of uh, lactate or glutamate being uh, labeled from glucose in this case. And the surprise had been that um, cortex or white matter um, have actually pretty similar labeling, even though white matter is supposed to be very low, metabolically speaking, and white matter is very, very high. We actually don't see that much of a difference, which is what we saw in the brain tumors also in the patient. So we're very excited to continue to look at this metabolic um, quantification of flux into um, uh, structures to, to the degree we can result in and correlate with neurophysiology and hopefully make some of these pigs uh, transgenic or, or subject them to control injury and see how things happen in um, real time and neurophysiologically and metabolically. So thank you very much. I believe I'm very on the time and I'll take questions. So um, maybe I will go uh, start with the questions. Um, uh, do you know the nature of that mutation, the GLUT1 mutation you initially described? Is that a, a complete loss of function or is it a partial loss of function? Yeah, we, we thought about that very carefully because the, you know we have about 300 North American patients right now, and maybe another couple of hundred international of which I believe we've been able to see about 250. Each of them will have a different mutation. There are very few who share the same mutation. All of them are loss of function, we think. Um, the challenge, DJ, had been that even people who share the same mutation have a different phenotype. So it's not a clear correlation in any way. People who you would think um, a frame shift early in the peptide as opposed to a missense at the C-terminal, it really doesn't matter. Uh, Lauren in the laboratory is working on that right now to prove that there's no such a correlation. There may be, but we haven't really obviously seen one. It's, very, it's just loss of function. Everybody has a different mechanism, uh, whether you have rapid internalization because you create a losing, losing uh, thin uh, motif, and that's clustering mediated endocytosis very quickly, or where you have a decrease in aggregation through the C-terminal domain, or whether you have a decrease in uh, efflux, not in influx, all of that we have seen in, in the different, it's a whole array, you know, like most diseases. Okay, thank you. Do you have, a, actually, let me follow up with that. Do you have a mouse? model that, that recapitulate the same phenotype? Yes. If, sure if you make that knockout in the mouth, you see the same uh, you, Yes, uh, if you knock it out, it's embryonic lethal at E12.5, and what you get is a uh, you know, great deal of, the, the neuroepithelium it's gone at E13 in the mouse, and it's actually replaced by monocytes. Not sure why, but um, this is sort of, um, 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 antisense, stable antisense, to allow you to have just 50% protein production. Another mouse we made in 2006 was just a plain um, heterozygote, hemizygote knockout. That mouse is very mild. You don't see, you don't see much of anything. Maybe a bit of rotor rod difference, but the one we have is 50%, and that mouse has a lot of seizures, a lot of ataxia. You know, they're probably PET scan um, findings. It looks like a patient. Patients are okay. just that way. You know, they're very clumsy, have a lot of seizures. Okay, so your patients are actually heterozygous? All of them. Ah, oh, okay, okay, got you, okay. I, well, I guess that's not true. I mean, one of them was a compound heterozygous because um, he had a mild mutation in one allele and a mild mutation in the other. So that subject happened, you know, but that's one out of 500 we know of. Any other questions? Alec had a question. Is triheptanoid yeah. effective to treat epilepsy? Um, we don't know, you know, people got this 
an idea we were doing this and so a number of people came in and said oh you gotta treat my child because they have epilepsy we tried it in the uh, SCN2A the sodium channel uh, 2A defect you know nothing to do with brain metabolism um, somebody had published uh, a PET scan in such a patient and argued that they have low brain glucose uh, intensity so I will try it was actually very effective in one of two not that effective in the second one. So I don't know that it would be helpful. Um, Hen Du, when he was at UTD, wanted to try this in the uh, uh, triple transgenic mouse that has um, Alzheimer's-like pathology. He just published that, uh, or we just published that. Uh, he showed that um, you do have preservation of synaptic boutons in that mouse. You know, they lose synapses very quickly, as you know, because of the amyloid uh, deposition. And he showed that, that link, that's linked to a behavioral correlate of amelioration of the Alzheimer's-like disease. And he also showed that you have less amyloid as if the, you know, the energetic balance being favorable had something to do with preserving the uh, degenerative phenotype. I can send that to you if you want to see it. Okay. Um, if no more questions, let's thank Juan again for a very interesting seminar. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. I have a question, Juan, but I'll ask it at the bar. Okay. Uh, which bar? There are so many of them. <laughs> we'll try a few of them. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Thanks so much.